with us. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> about presenting to you guys and also and so what we're going to present today. Um, so I'd like to, I guess, take us on a bit of a journey. Yeah. Um, and the journey is around a piece of research that we did. We started it probably in about 2010, and then we kept kind of going all the way through. But this is the first time that I've kind of presented it in the Cook Islands. So, um, so I'm very curious to to see how how, how it's received, how you guys take it, um, because it's a, it was a really interesting piece of work. It's a piece of work that I have to say is probably the most exciting piece of work that I've ever done, um, and it's called Mana Moana. Yeah. Uh, mana is the, all the little numbers mean the number of Pacific languages that that word is spoken in. And so mana is spoken in 36 different Pacific languages. Then you know mana, authority, um, the power of the phone going off. I'm sorry. Yeah. Actually, I'll just put it. And, um, and Moana is in 38 different languages. And it gives you a little bit of a hint of the research that we did. And it was called the journey to Mututapu because it was a journey. And I'll take you a little bit on the journey that we did. And it's about indigenous <coughs> Pacific psychological perspectives, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, and I did it with myself and a friend of mine. And actually it was a friend of mine, um, Dr. Carlo Miller, who was the lead in this. Yeah. But you'll see as we talk through. Um, yeah, I'll just get straight into it. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, yeah, as, as Teddy mentioned, um, we come from quite a hard science background. So I have a doctorate in neuroscience, um, specifically neuropsychopharmacology. I looked at the preclinical neural mechanisms underlying psychopharmacology and drug addiction. And what that all means is it's another language. Eh? And what that means is it's how your brain works. So I looked at how the brain works, I looked at what it does, I looked at how drugs influence the brain. Yeah? So we looked at neuroscience, we looked at the brain, yeah? and we looked at all the different things underlying it. And I did that about 20 years ago. Yeah? And um, well, I started it 20 years ago, I finished it about 15 years ago, and, um, and we published, and we, uh, we got offered a postdoc, I was in Philadelphia, um, and it was wonderful, kind of, except I didn't really, didn't really feel it, yeah? We could tell you all about the brain and how it worked and what was going on in there. I could tell you all about neural pathways and different mechanisms and modulation and blah, 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 blah. But my dad couldn't understand what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> Neither could any of my family, really. And actually, most people in the world couldn't understand what we were doing because it was very hard. <coughs> Biomedical science, yeah. Um, it was very specific, yeah. And I worked in a lab, so I wore a lab coat, and we looked at slides, slices, brain slices, and we looked at tissues, and it was kind of yeah. And um, and I was just not very into it, all. and that's what my doctorate was, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then at the same time, we were studying a thing called clinical psychology, and clinical psychology, it's all about what works according to science. Yeah, to help people out, how we can help them, how we can support them, according to science. What science says is the best things to work for different things. And in that space, we were doing individual therapy, so seeing people one on one. We were working with groups, groups of different groups, sometimes violent couple group, sometimes uh, addiction group, sometimes young offender group, sometimes hearing voices group, so we were doing a lot of group work and writing a lot of programs, but we were taking what they, uh, the best of I guess Western science and at that point was adapting it to a New Zealand context, yeah? And this is how the wellness industry works. And I say industry because it's a 4.2 trillion dollar industry. This is not a small area with a couple of us doing a few things. This is a $4.2 trillion business out there globally. And it is based on this. It is based on scientific, largely, anyway, scientific uh, research. So it's all about hypothesis testing. It's all about assessing things, then measuring, seeing against it. It's very individualistic. It's about the person. Sometimes you worry about other things, but it's very individualistic. 
individual focus. Research is individual focus too. It's very biomedical. We look at things like sounds and how they all work. Um, it's very objective, so it's about one, you look at them from one perspective and that is the way it is. Yeah? Some of that is shifting, but that's largely how it is. It's what we call empirical, it's absolute, um, and this rule applies to everybody. Yeah? So, what, so the way the scientific world, I'm making a few generalizations here, I'm saying this because it's going to be more precise and correct, but this is generally how it works, is that the scientific view is how it is put forward, that is what you do. And then what we do, it comes from there through assessment and intervention and theory, we assess the situation, and this is in the wellness and mental health space, we figure the problem depending on the Western theory we use, we look at what caused it, we look at what maintains it, we do the intervention, the treatment, da 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 da, and the person is cured. Yeah? That's in a nutshell kind of how it goes. Well, uh, and this actually works for about 70% of people, for lots of people, which is why there's value in it, because it does work. Yeah? You know, when you're mucky, you go to the doctor and you get a tablet and it helps get your diabetes under control. <laughs> Or you go and you know these things actually work, so they are very helpful. And but we were doing this in the clinic, and um, I was working largely with Māori and Pacific young people. In fact, I was working virtually entirely with Māori and Pacific young people. In Māori and Pacific, you could try and meet as well as Yeah, and this wasn't working. That whole way of doing things was not really working for our young people. And I think this is really important because all of us have family in New Zealand and Australia who are in these positions, yeah? We had increasing suicide rates, very high suicide rates. You know, for um, Kukai people in New Zealand, we um, have rates that are higher than the Papa are and are comparable to Māori Mutuli Nia, yeah? Our imprisonment rates, so for, uh, for the Kukai people over there, our imprisonment rates are also very elevated, but it's mostly violent crime. Yeah, we're not really the, the thieves. But what you get is you get uh, young people over there who are maybe second or third generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And disconnected from here. You know, don't really know how they Yeah. Mental illness rates are high. Our rates over there are higher than Papa and they're higher than Hollywood to me. Yeah. One in three Papa Islanders in New Zealand will have a mental illness this year. Mm -hmm. That's one, two, three, one of us is going to have a mental illness. This is high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So these are high. Our child abuse rates are really bad as well. And I'm not going to go into these. And also we don't access services over there. And the story over there is that there's something wrong with us. Yeah. So it's not the method that we're using to treat or to work people or something wrong with them, there's something wrong with us. Yeah? And that was a story that just didn't really work for me. Not only did it not work for me, it didn't work for a lot of people who I work with um, and who we were talking with. And it was, what about our amazingness? Yeah. For every young Pacific and Māori young person over there that was having issues, there were five that were creating. And this work piece is by an uh, um, arts group in Asian, and he is, and Onesian is Onesian, he is, he celebrates his urban Asian, Polynesian ness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for every young person that struggles, there are many that are actually creating and making major. Yeah. But this whole world of Western <coughs> well-being doesn't look at this. Yeah? Yes. yeah. Is there a reason why you left A out in that meeting? Oh, I don't see. <laughs> 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 I think we can know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> my brain works and I don't even see. <laughs>
of this, the story is that there is something wrong with us. And so there were many of us that are having this conversation around actually, why is it this working for Māori specific peoples? Yeah. And it does work to a certain extent, but there's a whole lot that it doesn't work with. And so some of the conversations that were going around were, um, you know, where did this all go? And I'm just going to chuck in one slide around this. Yeah. And that is the history of colonisation. Yeah. And there's only one thing I want to say about this was that it was not done on purpose. Yeah. Um, this is a map from 1939, and it was a map about how they were dividing the Pacific up. Yeah. So they divided up amongst all these different countries. Yeah. How they divide up this. You know, we all know that we went to New Zealand, or so um, for me, so I was born in New Zealand, eh? Yeah. And then we used to go backwards and forwards to Archie. Backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, yeah. But for our, most of our family, they went to the tour, and they settled in the tour. And they all worked in the mill, and we went there for opportunity, we were a labour force. Yeah. They viewed us as work, we could work. <coughs> and what they did, and this was very purposeful, is that they went and they they attacked our religion, our social structure, our education and our health, and they designed it. Yeah. So that we lose feelings of who we are. Yeah. And that's colonisation. This guy in front of our was actually one of the ones who planned it all. <laughs> yeah. He planned, they planned to divide the Pacific up, to break down our social structures, our societies, to move us around to make us all market force. But now it's often our kids overseas that are losing things, yeah. that are losing language, like me, ask these two about my Māori. <laughs> <laughs> they will tell you, you know, and yeah, not the name. Um, you know, we, we get there, but there is loss, and for our young people this is a big thing. And we were talking about this, I was talking about this with colleagues, and colleagues of ours at uh, the bars and got some good friends of ours within the mental health space around what do we do about this? And so we, um, and the big question is what is healing for our people, for indigenous Pacific people? What does that mean to me? What works? What did work? What does work? And um, does that work now? Yeah? And so these were the questions we were asking ourselves. So we were asking what, what is, what is, what does Pacific peoples mean anyway too? We know what violent means, but do we? Because uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> but what does that mean? Yeah. And what does it mean? What is healing for us? What works for us? Yeah. And so I got together with a good friend of mine, Carlo. Uh, for the picture. She's a Tongan. Yeah. She actually got together with me. She did a postdoc um, on what is healing for Pacific peoples. So she went out and as to kind of use some of um, Eliza's kind of thinking, she went out and she collected the flowers. Yeah. And she did a postdoc and she went and she interviewed, she was doing, and for her postdoc we were initially her supervisor, I was a clinical supervisor, she was a research supervisor, and that's the kind of cool one, eh? And so she went out and she interviewed over a hundred different traditional healers, knowledge holders, clinicians and clients and people from across the Pacific. Yeah. And by that from Western Pacific, Fiji, Samoa, Roma, up to Hawaii, over to here, bit of Tahitian, bit of Cook Island, and then even Maori to the end. So the whole lot. Because even though we're divided, yeah, we're also very similar. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and she gathered all of these flowers. Um, with Tangata, with Moana Nui Akiba. Tangata is said in 38 different languages. That's a lot. Yeah? Moana is 31 different languages. Yeah? And she came with the flowers. And she bought the flowers, eh? She picked the flowers, she went out, she did the interviews. And then we had to sort these flowers out because you know when you make a nakatu, you don't just put anything in. You put specific flowers in. You put and you also cut out, you throw out the bad ones, you put the good ones in, you decide what stays in, you decide what you're making it, what you're making it for. Yeah? And we had to sort them. And there was literally thousands of hours of transcripts and interviews and gold. Yeah. It was 
a pretty magical lot of information and quite overwhelming. Yeah? And there were hundreds of perspectives in this and opinions. And she had gathered these with respect and the integrity of all the people that she had spoken with. And that's a lot of commitment to honour it as well. Yeah. It's a very, it was, it was massive. And, um, and so our job was to sort them and then to weave something out of that. And then we had to see whether it was of value. Because it is no good making something beautiful if it doesn't fit. Yeah. I try, I do it for my daughter all the time. I make her able to with the adult size one and then it fall off her. Yeah. <laughs> you want to make sure it fits and it is of value. Yeah. And so that, that is what we did. And this is probably our indigenous methodology. So when we talk about it, it's how, how we did it. And so um, it was pretty awesome. So we'll just walk you through a little bit of that. So we didn't just use any type of flowers. We used certain flowers. We were looking for certain information. More specifically, she was looking for certain information. She was looking for what had value, what was healing, what people found valuable. And it had to be in 15 languages or more. Couldn't just be Samoan, because we all know that, um, you know, often in Pacific research, one ethno-specific, one model will become the dominant model, eh? Yeah? So, uh, uh, Fonofale, for example, is a Pacific model of music pump, but it's a Samoan model, eh? Yeah. And that is cool. It is a very cool model, and it is a very good thing. But that is one specific model. For this one, it had to be shared. So it had to be in 15 different languages. This is a Western linguistic model yeah, of the different languages and it had to hit 15 of those to be included. Yeah. It was pretty massive, it was probably. <laughs> and then it, we looked for shared stories. Yeah, what stories were shared across from Hawaii to New Zealand, Equinac, and then over to the Western, you know, the Samoan and the Vietnam. Yeah. We looked for shared processes and ideas. So she was very selective about collecting this information. Yeah. It wasn't just anything, but then we get to sort it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was big. And uh, there were many times that she lived in Auckland and I lived in Hastings. Yeah. And there were many times we would go back with the water, she'd come down, we'd go out and spend the weekend together thinking about how we're going to, there's so much stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. And some of it is tapu knowledge as well. It's not knowledge that was easily shared, or it's not knowledge you want to play with too much. <coughs> like with that, you might get an allergic reaction to them. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, sometimes you need to be careful. Yeah. Um, but we began sorting, and we began with words. So we started sorting out words that were common in these interviews. Yeah. This is the word that is how many languages are spoken in. So with the 37 different languages, yeah. Uh, Maru, 22. Now remember that these words in conversation were all around well-being. This was people speaking about well-being and using these words, yeah. So they were speaking about um, waves of emotion, coming on the hopper together. They were speaking about not only the winds coming through, yeah. 37 different languages for Maru. This is, this is pretty um, massive, yeah? And you can see how they kind of all came together. And yeah. feel free to jump in any time. And then it was about finding these proverbs that come with them. And proverbs from all different languages. Well, big people who are Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Can I ask you So, for example, did you interview 37 people of that work with her, or like you know, 37 people and they were talking about it? No, so, we, so, so she interviewed, so Carla did all the interviews, she interviewed um, well over 100, it was like 120 different people about Pacific Wellbeing. <coughs> And then they started talking about things like, I don't know, yeah, 
Yeah, so they started talking about these ideas, and so in all of these interviews, then all of these words keep popping up. Yeah? And so we talk about well-being, self-esteem, identity, blah, 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 blah. They talk about, you know, not a long waves that might come in with you, or, so there's different language, yeah? So then we started pulling, or she started pulling the information and clustering it into different things, yeah? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. 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 Well, this, I yeah. think this will help in yeah. our research. So, um, what device did you use? What an analysis? Yeah. Yeah, so we could have gone with the thematic analysis, that's what we typically you would have gone with, is kind of some sort of thematic analysis. But we just sat on the words for ages. Did you record them? Video? Oh yeah. So there's transcripts of all of this. There's um, recordings of all of this. Yeah. 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 So then it was recorded, transcribed, and then looking at the themes that were coming out of this. Yeah. And so what what actually really happened is that we this process, by the way, took probably about four years. So it wasn't a fast thing. It was a very slow thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So all those tools from the different. And also they don't take exactly the same form. Baka, 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 baka. So they take a say what they call proto linguistics. So yeah. Um, so often these words have slightly different expressions here, but they mean the same thing and they have an original linguistic term. I've got some stuff here, for example, around some of the different words. And you can have a look at it. Um, so Moana has the different forms of Moana in the different languages. Yeah. Um, and different references to them, yeah? And then there's this, um, there's this big dictionary out there by this big called Trevia. Have you guys heard of Trevia? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Trevia wrote about, and there's also a big database out there called Pollux. Yeah? So this is where people have studied specific languages. Ask Aki about this. <laughs> she knows much more about this stuff. Yeah. She talked about the situation. Yes. Yeah. 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 So she's probably the better person to question around the linguistic component of it. Yeah. Um, because it's the commonalities in it all. Um, so when we began sorting through the words, then people referred to proverbs. So often when you're talking, people will talk about proverbs, eh? They didn't talk directly about um, identity or uh, self-harm or different things like that. They talked about proverbs. People talk in metaphor of proverbs. So we collated proverbs that went with the different ideas. There's a whole lot of stuff here um, in, in this book around the different proverbs that line up with the different words. And then there were stories. And these are stories that are shared across the Pacific. The story of Rata goes right across the whole Pacific. We have a wicked Mayan version. It's a good version. Yeah? It's a really good version. There is the river of Maui that go right across. Yeah? Our northerners all know about Maui. Yeah? But then our Hawaiian brothers and sisters and our Monumentalini brothers and sisters have slightly different versions of Maui. Yeah? Yeah? But it's all Maui. We have stories of Tiniro, Ina, or Tiniroki. Yeah? Then we have Kangaroa. We have Papa, we have Rongo, Tane, Tu. So these are some of our Atua mythologies, see? Eh? Yeah. And then we, of course, have our Baka stories. And these stories go right across. Takitumu is a classic. Takitumu started in Kangaroa and moved across. They went to Fiji, they went to Nakataniti, they cruised around, they came here. You know, I can read it in here. And then some say, who knows? But these stories are shared. You know? And so we looked at these stories. And the question I'm asking myself because I'm a clinician, and my job is to help people when they're not good, is was this useful? Was any of these stories and proverbs and things useful with the people I was working with? And the short answer is, so I tried it. And this we call action research. Eh? Yeah. So we have this amazing, beautiful body of knowledge, but we need to try it and see, is it helpful? Because knowledge is no good unless, wow, no, this is, yes it is. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. Um, 
<laughs> but for me, I want to know that it's useful. Is this going to help people? Yeah, that's my. That's what's important to me. Yeah, and it is. In short, you can see these are pictures that different people did. So this one on the left hand side was from Kupai, uh, the boy and family that we were working with. Yeah, and so we're talking about we're talking about concepts relating to the moana, ideas relating, and it helped him understand what is going on for him in his life. It helped him talk to his family around what is going on for him in his life. Yeah? It helped him view himself. Sharks get dolled on here by coping with the... Yeah. You know, it helped him understand. Yeah? This was a Psalm 1 boy <coughs> that we were working with, and he was in prison this one. And uh, it gave him a different understanding. But it was gave him a way of understanding the story of his life, what was happening, where he was, how he ended up in jail, why things were so bad for him, how it was that he wanted to go here to his Maina, to his Maina, to his family, but how he ended up here on Mangumal Island. Yeah. So it gave a way of him understanding his story. For me, the story of Ru was really powerful. Because it's a beautiful story of somebody leaving, setting off and facing challenge after challenge after challenge and then the faith and then getting where they go. And for our kids, these stories are stories of, we call them, the, um, you know, stories of resilience, eh? Mm -hmm. Stories of overcoming challenge, yeah? Now, this is not how people work in the well-being business. This is very different, yeah? But it gave language, it gave words, when people talk about waves of feelings and how they play, the depth. One of, um, it gave them a language to use, yeah? But then <laughs> with it, when so we thought, yeah, this is, this is actually worth, not only is it an amazing collection of information, but actually there's a real usefulness with it too. And then there was this whole landscape. <laughs> So that was the moana, yeah? And we call it the Motu Tapuru landscape, eh? Because Motu is 34 different languages. People talk about islands, yeah? Yeah, Tapu, we all know what Tapu means in different yeah. ways, 38 different languages. And it's here, and it's there, mm -hmm. and it's in virtually every other country across the Pacific. It's an island, it's an island called Motu Tapu, eh? So we had different domains, the Moana domain, the Ingoa domain, the Kaina, the Val, the Uta. Yeah. And within these, they all have words and they all have proverbs. And there's stuff up here that you can have a look at. Yeah. So just to skim you on a very quick trip through Motu Tapu, when we go into Inua, we start talking about Moana, things growing, the Inua, yeah? So we move from the language of the Moana yeah? We start going into Hawaii, the Ora. So we start discovering a whole, these are all shared groups by the way, none of these are not, they're all shared. Why am I to grow? Cycles and seasons. And it gives us an exploring. Data Popeye, the developmental perspective, eh? Yeah. So we talk about, you know, you know, from a Kupaida proverb, eh? But if you walk with Kupaida, me arobe te pai ora, yeah? <coughs> How would this proverb help you understand something in your life? Maybe no questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, for this, we choose the word, we looked at the, there's a couple of words in here that came out. One was tupu and one was why. These were words that were spoken about when we were asking people about well-being, about being well, about mental health, yeah? And so we get the words, we get the proverbs, we get the stories, and then I ask the question, is this useful? Yeah? And it gives us a, a developmental perspective. When you think about tupuanga, what do you think? What comes into your mind? Growth. Yeah. And it's growth linear or status. Status, yeah. And do things die? Of course. Of course. Yes, it is a must. Yeah. So it gives us a whole nother understanding. And it's growth beautiful and happy all the time. It is. 
Tariora. Tariora, yeah, it's not. If it's, there's different elements to different things. So when you're referring to a human, because you were this, I think it's like how you nurturing it. Mm -hmm. Love? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. You know, the things that are happening around, they're there. You know, if there is no rain, what happens? No. For, uh, for all the children you teach, if there is no love coming into their home, what happens? They won't come to your Yes. If there is no, uh, if there is no, and Niti will speak better about this when she talks about uh, the other, the pedanas, yeah? So you see how our language and our words and how we believe things becomes how we understand our world. Now this again is very different to the Western model. The Western model goes dum dum dum. Yeah. Um, this here was a was a boy that we worked with, and it was this is like the tree of his life. Yeah. And so you can't really see it, but there's different chunks where things took slices at him. Nearly got knocked over, nearly died. Luckily, the roots were a bit stronger and we survived it because they possibly would have. This kid had a pretty rough upbringing, like a really rough upbringing. Yeah. Um, this one here was another one who was talking about him as being a mupo, but actually his tupuna, because tupu, tupuna, and, yeah. uh, and then also about him, what he wants to pass on to his people, you know, his children. What's really powerful about this is this is done by a boy in jail. A 16 year old in jail. 16 year olds don't go to jail for nothing. And in New Zealand they definitely go to jail for nothing. Yeah? You know, and, but yet, that is how he, he was able to start thinking about stuff that he would never think about before. Yeah? Um, then another domain was into the claimer. And that's more about relationships and all your needs. You know, we go to the village. This is a landscape where we walk through different parts of the landscape, and there's different value in different areas. Um, and was it, was it valuable? Was it useful? Yeah, yeah, it is. Because when you're sitting down with people and you roll up the mat and you come to sit on the mat and you have a conversation about what this one is bringing, and then you start bringing in family to have those conversations around. You're weaving together a whole lot of stuff that only happens in that context. You don't discuss stuff on the map when you're out at sea, and it's not a very good one. <laughs> you know, there are things for land, there are things for places, and there are things for there. Yeah, you don't, you know, there are things you do with different spaces, and this was the relationship space. The space where you're putting in the connections, the relationships, the dynamics, yeah? And then we had the bar. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the right thing is for people here. Yeah? But that is when you go up the bush and jump up the bar. Yeah. 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 Down the <laughs> And in that domain, we talk about things like before, you know, being at night, night when the ghosts are around, and actually there's truly scary things out there. <laughs> Yeah, and for me in mental health, when I work with people who hear voices, this helps them understand different things. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes I've got to be careful about how far we go. <laughs> yeah. But there is a way of understanding it, of, uh, of understanding that perspective. Climbing the mona, climbing the mona, going through the bush, really, it's not that easy. Yeah, there are challenges, but there is a perspective you get from the top of the mona. <coughs> You can see things that you can't see when you're like down in the under, okay? You can see, you know, it gives you another language. And then, you know, for ourselves going in, the deepest part of the two lakes we have, or the lagoon, yeah? But inside ourselves, too, eh? Yeah. But there's a whole lot of stuff happening within this landscape and this well being. Um, and it, that, is, that is the multi type of landscape. And, um, and what we did was we took this stuff and we turned it into programs. The first program that we did was an eight week program and we ran it um, with uh, boys that were part assistants, yeah? All Māori and Pacific, yeah? And we gave it a go and like everything, the first time you wear something together, it's going to be a little different, yeah? 
So you, you're weaving it, and, but remember that Carlo was very practiced in what she wore. She wore the things she was bringing to the table were the finest, so we had to be very careful with it. And we've also written many programs before. This wasn't the first program we've done with boys in prison and boys with SWA. So we practiced it. We did an eight-week program with the system. They loved it. So then we decided to try another one. And then we ended up running several in a, what we call a camps complex, child and adolescent mental health. Mm -hmm. Then we ran one, um, then we ran a, a wild couple one. So we got wild couples together and we ran a camp. <laughs> yeah, a journey. A journey. So it was about journeying through the landscape. Some of these might be one journey, so like a weekend. Some of them might be a weekend, one weekend here, one weekend here, one weekend here, one weekend here. Some of them were two hour sessions every week. But we're taking people on these journeys through these different ideas so they can explore themselves yeah, and find out who they are. Sometimes it was journeys with families in tow and partners. And sometimes it was journeys by themselves. And it was, um, it was really cool. We were spending so much time doing it that we forgot to publish anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the first rule of research, especially when it's HRC funded research, is that you publish. Yeah. Um, but also we're doing clinical work, you know, where this is actually, this is, for me, this is indigenous, and I know that this is um, not strictly Kukana, but it's very Kukana. Yeah. And it's indigenous, it's an indigenous approach to understanding, it's an indigenous approach to well being. Yeah. Part of it for us too was that it had to be teachable and translatable. Again, it is no good to make something beautiful if nobody can appreciate it or use it. And so what we did was that we were teaching other people how to use this landscape. But it's not like me imparting to you this is how it is, it's actually how you experience it. Because everybody has their own landscapes. There is no definition, this is how it must be. Yeah. Now we're getting grey, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and one way I like to look at it is that you need to come in a boost start compass, eh? Which you use in the water. Because another passion in my life is water. <laughs> yeah? And um, you use the stars and you see where they rise and where they set. And that is one way of finding your way around. This is the traditional proper R way, the compass. Yeah. This is the modern proper R way. Yes. There are many different ways of finding your way around and this provides us with one way of doing it. Yeah? A pretty cool way of doing it. Um, we also realised underneath that there was a whole lot of logic. And I'm actually thinking I might just skip through it. What are we doing time-wise? Are we good? Yeah. Yeah. good? Yeah. So this was very heavily <laughs> off, um, I guess, Western Pacific concepts. And I'm really curious to see how that applies here too. Yeah. Um, and so, as we were going through this landscape, there were certain things that kept coming up over and over again. Yeah. And one of the principles that particularly came from someone in Fiji was the concept of bar. Yeah. Have you guys heard of bar? So for me, I think it's a gap. Yeah. 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 For them, it is a space, how do a part, but a space that you need, yeah, that pull you together. And there is a whole lot of people about that, or about how about them, or about Tino, your physical self. Again, this is Western Pacific stuff there. La Muna, La Muna. The La Muna, the La Muna, the La Muna, I think of the La Muna, the La Muna, the La Muna. There are different conceptualizations, yeah. But the important thing about the space is that it is a space around us all that connects us and binds us, yeah? The Samoan, Thomas Sissi, he refers to Vata Buya. And it's a sacred space that we are all connected in. And this is some of the stuff that Carla was collecting in her interviews. And when you read it, it's very heavy, yeah? It's not shallow, this is deep, yeah? And um, this is Thomas Sisi, what he says about how is this it's the sacred space between man and all things, alive and dead. Yeah. Moving 
it is that there is a relationship between all things living and dead, a sacred essence. And the sacred relationships extends to in all things that some non indigenous references, where there is a genealogical connection. So we have the same principles, maybe we talk about it differently, yeah? Yeah. And within that space there is a process that you have to. So what we are bringing, what we are giving out to different things that we are doing, when you guys are teaching, yeah. when you're teaching what you're giving out, but also what you're taking in from all of those kids. They are all of them and their teachers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it happens with colleagues at work as well. Yeah. There's a flow. And in this theory, in this idea, the other do that one. It's ideal. You know what you're looking for. It's like, well, I've said that all night. Sounds nice, eh? <laughs> it is nice. But life isn't in a solid state. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we all have processes and emotions and feelings and, uh, and hurts in my mind that comes in and comes out in different relationships. Whether it be with other people, whether it be with our environment, yeah, whether it be with our relationship with God, yeah. And in this theory, that's what happens. So they can sexualize Mala and Salah, whereas I'd say we would say Allah, yeah, yeah. Where we put where hurts go in, and then it gets messed up. And then it's come out and get messed up. And then it just keeps going. Yeah. And then you have a big mess. Yeah. To untangle. Yeah. So this becomes something that we work with with the everybody is untangling the big mess. And sometimes when people say, What do you do? And I say, I untangle messes. That's <laughs> what my job is, see? Yeah. And so, excuse the language, was this useful? Is that idea useful with the people that we work with? In short, yes it is. Because if this is how they conceptualise the spaces that they have going on, that is not a pretty picture, but at least they're starting to understand what is happening. Yeah? And so in these journeys, we're always exploring these different things. I'm just going to skip that one and then it's up on another chart. And so in these journeys, we look at all of this, we look at the Arawa, up to Arawa mind, what is happening in different spaces and different aspects of the domain. And then I looked at the Western science, because I'm a geek. So I looked at it and I said, in Western science, is there anything that, that aligns with this? And in short, there is, but nothing <coughs> coherent like what we have here. Yeah? You know, we know that these things work for different people, we know that they do. Yeah? Um, and then we scientifically test it. So we, and I don't really have much results on this because I couldn't find them. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did was we bring out, um, so we remember it had many iterations where we tried out many things. So we put it together, we tried it in this format, we tried it in that format, we tried it individual, we tried it group, we ran it in for this problem and that problem. We ran a trauma group on it, you know, we used it in different ways, we ran a depression group on it. But then we did a, um, and this was a, um, a study with Wesley College, it was with the um, at Wesley College, that's in Northland. They're mostly Maori and Pacific here. Yeah. Wesley College is out in Bukkui, and it's a boarding school, and it's a boarding school. Yeah. Um, and tested it for outcomes, it was what we call mixed methods pre and post. So mixed methods means we use qualitative interviews and data. Yeah. And we interviewed the kids and measured them on a whole bunch of scales before the program, after the program, and a year later. Yeah. And in a nutshell, it was good. I should have the data for you. I was looking for it this morning quite high out, and it was great. Yeah. Um, so what we found there, all participants felt that it was valuing. All of them showed decreases in negative symptoms. So symptoms of depression, anxiety, um, self-esteem, cultural awareness. 
for all of those went down, oh, I forgot went up, but all of those ones went down. All the bad things went down, and all the good things went up. And then it was maintained up over time. You know? yeah. We did some stuff with the, um, with the prison boys and collecting clean post data, and we see improvements after they've done this, and how they, and their depression, their anxiety, their anger. But remember, this is not white hat wonder stuff. You don't go overseas and then you go and then everything's happy. These are programs. You know, these are eight, three months, six months. They take a period of time, eh? Yeah? Um, yeah, information overload, probably. It's a lot of stuff. And thank you for allowing us to share with you on it. Because I think when we talk about indigenous research and we talk about indigenous research methodology, um, we don't know how amazing what we have is. Yeah. And, and I guess part of the reason why I think this is so amazing is that I know the other side very, very, very well. Yeah. I know pharmacology, I know neuroscience, I know um, traditional methodologies very, very well. But what we have is incredible, yeah? And sometimes I don't think that we really kind of celebrate that, yeah? yeah? But I also think too that the world out there is not going to believe us just because we say it is, yeah? We have to show it. And that was part of our thing with all of this was that we had to, you know, um, uh, I remember having a meeting with uh, Taria Turia and she was keen as. So, Pariyam uh, Turiya is the woman of the Father And actually, this is an interesting, this is an interesting story. Um, so, we, um, we got invited in to meet with her about this stuff because um, she wanted to work on different things for young people and for um, across, across MSD and to work within New Zealand. Yeah? And we went to that meeting, and for me, it was a really important meeting because. Uh, came down from Hastings, I flew down and I went to my cousin's funeral because he just killed himself and then I come straight into a meeting about how we can use this to work with people and this is what it's about because other things aren't, yeah? And what happened then is that it was all green light. It was like, yeah, come in and do this and teach people how to do it so that we can use it bigger. But then other people wanted to say, and what they said to us straight up was, where's your evidence? Without what they call an RCT, a randomised clinical control, you don't have evidence for this, you don't have proof that it works, and therefore we are not going to share it. Yeah? And that's the reality of our research world too, is that research, they demand evidence, and actually funding often demands evidence outside of the providers. <coughs> um, so, so part of the importance of research is to be able to show that what we do have is not only a value, it's a value here, but actually it's a value for all your kids overseas. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a lot of them. Yeah. 75,000 mm -hmm. over there that are not here. Yeah. You know, part of this is about keeping our own heritage alive and our own culture. And I am so not the right person to be saying that because I'm a... Uh, well, look at me. <laughs> you know? We can't from New Zealand and into this trip that it is about it because actually it gives us opportunity. Yeah? I'm going to stop rambling on. Yeah. The, I guess the other thing too is it is about the process. Yeah. It is about the collaboration. Carla collected the flowers. I did not collect the flowers. Yeah. She collected the flowers. My job was to weave it. And there are other things that she has woven with some of these flowers as well that are not just in the space that I work in, which is the therapeutic space. Yeah. I'm very tempted to show you some of it. Shall I? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so this is this is not my work. This is her work. Yeah. This is she collected the flowers. She gathered them. I came in and I wrote together the, this, the, some of the one and one multi time program stuff with her and the journeys and that stuff with her. And then, but then with the flowers, some of the other things that she's made. Is um so this this is an interactive is, is there a speaker in here? Uh, I'm not sure there is. I think there's a small one that should come through the data projector, but it's not really loud. 
And then the journal. So this was like the the kind of journal that people had and they walked through. Yeah. So this went with the program that was being delivered eh? Yeah, so that they had paper stuff, yeah. And things to reflect on and ideas. Because for a lot of our kids in Tanini, they don't know heaps of this. That heaps. You know, you talk to your Kukala kids there and uh, they don't know heaps. <laughs> I'm not going to ask your mamas to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, there's heaps that they don't know, and there's heaps that to be kind of shown and taught and to explore and to understand. And uh, often for our kids over there, they need to be explicitly told things because yes. they, the idea of observing and watching is different. Mm. It's a different way of doing that. Mm. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so it was a, the, the program was very structured, and in part of that program, there was a whole part about coming together, having, uh, coming together, working together, sailing together, because we were on the upper stage at that time, working together, keeping a safe space, honoring each other, respecting So there was to create that, to build their confidence. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so the program was um, give our Pacific students a taste of yeah. our lifestyle. Taste of our lifestyle and to build up, yeah, and to for them to understand different things, to understand. Often we talk about self esteem, like it's something that we all know what it is. But this is the way that they can, we can explore self esteem, how they grow, to explore themselves, really. Yeah. So it was to give our understanding from a traditional point of view, kind of, and then, but to understand themselves, yeah, so that they could look at themselves and kind of get perspective on that, yeah? Yeah. Actually, yeah. I just asked a question that's about, or kind of thinking about the students in this course mm -hmm. and thinking about what we've done in this project with Paolo. And so I think the thing to, to remember for yourselves as students in this course is that the research that was done at the beginning mm -hmm. that Paolo did picking the flowers from mm -hmm. around the so instead of picking the flowers around the whole, you know, um, Pacific Triangle like Paolo did, you'll be picking the flowers mm -hmm. if you were going to use this mm -hmm. methodology, mm -hmm. the picking the flowers in your school or in your community. Mm -hmm. And that will be your research that you will then analyse or weave or yeah. whatever the way that um, Evangeline had to take the flowers and make the apple do. Okay, so you'll take your flowers and you will decide which flowers you will work with and which flowers will be left behind. Mm -hmm. And you will look to see what story is being told. And then you will have, that will be your findings, yeah? And then you will then just, your findings, then you will think, so what now? Yeah. Like Evangeline did. She thought, okay, let's see. What the our story works actually and did some more action research. So the research led to more research, to more research. Your research might be the same. You'll do your little research project, you'll find out some things, and if you'll ask the question, so what what's the point of this? What can I do with this to make things better for our kids around the world?